Okay, welcome back to another uh, episode of Brick and Mortar. I'm Nick Hill. I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel Foch. And today we've got Vince Taylor, a uh, world traveler, entrepreneur, president of the BC-based Pilot House, which is one of Canada's biggest real estate sales and marketing firms with over 17,000 homes sold. Vince also wrote a book, which isn't exactly a real estate book, and he was kind enough to send Dan and I copies of it, uh, but we'll dive into that later. So without further ado, Vince, welcome to the uh, Brick and Mortar Podcast. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I'm excited to be here and uh, love talking to people across the country, and hopefully we can dig up some gold here for your listeners. Love it. Yeah, you're you're in Vancouver, as I as we were just saying before we hopped on. I'm a uh, Vancouver born and raised myself, so it's always nice to have people from across the uh, the country with different perspectives. Even though it, you know we, the the country itself is getting a lot smaller from a real estate perspective, um, that's still uh, it's still great. And I know you guys got snow out there. We have some snow here, so <laughs> well, we we just tell you guys that so you won't come out here. That's that's the yeah. whole policy. Here. <laughs> You don't have to shovel rain, man. You lived in Kitsilano, you know about it. I'm 50 exactly. years in Westminster, so uh, yeah, we just tell everybody it's awful. Don't come, don't come up here. It's Love terrible. it. Yeah, take his advice. Don't go. Um, right. So let's just, uh, you know, uh, the introduction says says a lot, but I want to know more. How, like, you know, you've over 17,000 homes sold and marketed. Where did that start? You you founded this business back in 2002. Walk us through the the early days of Vince, because it's it's nice to see where you are where you are now, and we'll get to where you're going. But bring us back to the beginning, and, and kind of I'd love to hear the story. Well, as you can see by all this gray hair, <clears throat> I'm kind of fossilized now. But uh, so I won't go back as first the earth cooled, but that's going back a little too far. But really, uh, I came from the development business, and I think that's what. Without this is not a commercial for Pilot House. This is a perspective that you asked about. I came from the development business and I built and developed a lot of homes with my own money and with my own risk, you know, go buy the land, figure out how to finance it, figure out about construction as a young guy. I didn't know anything. There's no playbook for development and you, you can kind of go to school, but really the school is getting your butt kicked. That That's the school. Uh, you need to do four or five of these. And I was a successful developer, we'll call it for about a decade. And then, um, you know, if we're going to be fully transparent, the, the recession of 1999 took me out. And it's, a, it's an experience I wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. It's a terrible, terrible thing. I had young children at the time. You know, you basically lose everything. Uh, the wounds are deep. And I, I, I weathered it uh, with a lot of help and, and some good luck. But at the same time, when I entered the brokerage side of things, uh, I carried that experience with me. And one of the thing I think, one of the things that sets Pilot House apart is you're dealing with me. And I carry the scars of what goes, what can go wrong. And this is a tough, tough business. Multifamily marketing and sales, multifamily development is not for the faint of heart. And if you want to get into it, generally, I try to talk people out of it. I say, you sure. Like if you got 20 or 50 million, go to the beach because you could have a lot less when this is over. And if you really want to do it, listen to me. Don't pat me on the head as a little supplier guy. I've been through this and walked down this path. So that's kind of the a thing that separates is a lot of guys get into the brokerage business wanting to be developers. I still do development on my own and on the side, but it's a tough, tough business. And it's mostly singles and doubles. And people think the big evil developers that make all this money. You know, your internal rates of return aren't that high. And for the risk, the reason people do it is cash on cash is 100%. And you can't do that in any other business, but it's tremendously difficult. So I started out small, very quick, funny story. I, I had never done something called a conversion, which tends to happen at the end of a frothy real estate market. We're going to start to see it happen in Toronto and Vancouver, where you take an old building and you put a little lipstick on it and you say, it was a rental building. Now it's condos, right? And it fits that price point in between the new build, the old, and then there's this weird thing. And it, it lasts kind of like a genie in a bottle. It lasts about 18 months. And then, you know, the market's going to end after that. So a guy said to me, have you ever done a conversion in Seattle? And I'm thinking, I don't even know what a conversion is. I kind of have a vague idea where Seattle is. Of course, I've done a hundred of them. What could go wrong? So <laughs> off I went to do a conversion in Seattle. And then somebody said, they want to do a bunch of buildings in Vancouver. Sure, what could go wrong? So got into the brokerage business kind of without a huge business plan, but bringing with it the development experience and the understanding of how to do it. So literally as a full service shop, 
our clients can be super involved or they can just say, here's the keys. I'm going back to wherever. See you in two years. And so over the years, we've built this business up and uh, we're pretty boutique. I don't like to get make it very big because people want to talk to me. It's a 24-7 business. I have a great team, but it, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. And if you're not into it as a lifestyle, you guys reference work until midnight. That's how you win, right? Yeah. This is not a job. It's a lifestyle. And if you're not prepared to work 24-7, don't do it. That's an uh, interesting, interesting note, actually, Nick, I know you got a bunch of uh, framework stuff, but, um, you know, Jeff Bezos, who I, I would say is pretty qualified at the whole capitalism thing, yeah. uh, talks, talks a lot about this concept in his book called uh, work life harmony, rather than work life balance. And it sounds like you're talking about something similar, right? Having yeah. this, you know, like committing to the fact that it's a lifestyle and making sure that the people you surround yourself with are, are game with that, right? Um, I, not I got place. invited to speak at a college. It's in the book there, Nick. And uh, I didn't get invited back. So you know how the story is going to end. <laughs> uh, you know, basically, they asked me to talk about work-life balance. And I wasn't in a very good mood for whatever reason. I basically told them they were a bunch of babies. And there was no such thing in work-life balance. If you want to win, you work 100 hours a week. And if you don't want to win, you don't like piss off. That was the end of it. So can't say that on your podcast. Anyway, um, they said, well, that's not very nice. And I said, well, ask any successful person from the Bezos to whoever, if you just work more hours than everybody else, even at eight bucks an hour, if financial success is how you define winning, you win. But if you're not prepared to work, then you don't win. There's no shortcut, you know, work, save, invest. That's it. There's no shortcut. Um, we are a swearing friendly podcast. Just oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll still keep it to a minimum. <laughs> we'll, just ahead, put a, we'll just put a PG 13. Yes, yes. 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 My wife says, don't swear to me. Okay. That's all right. I, there's, there's more reason to swear these days than, than ever. So, um, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and, and before we start to do that, I just want to, I, you know, I think Dan and I are both advocates and completely agree. And the work-life balance thing never really done it for me. It's gotta be work-life harmony, work-life balance. I feel is for people that have jobs and and a means to an end work-life harmony is for people that have careers and businesses that you're right you are working 24 7 but you know some of that work might be going to a Leafs or a Canucks game or going to the golf course or going down to Florida and and you know the uh people on the outside are kind of looking at well that's that's not work this guy's you know he's at the Leafs game two nights a a month kind of thing. Well, yeah. if I'm there with clients and I'm, and I'm trying to sell pro, I mean, I'd rather be there with my buddies or back at home with my okay. girlfriend or wife or kids or something, but um, yeah. And you're, I, and you're a thousand bucks lighter when you get home from a night at the Leafs game with clients. At That's, least, you know, at least, at least and let me yeah. say before I get heat, hate mail, somebody has got to teach the kids and drive the buses and work in the prisons. And we're not hacking on people who work for a living and really, really enjoy getting off work at four 30 without that, our society doesn't run. If all of us crazy people, we're trying to run society. This shit would not work. So this is no commentary. We're talking today. I asked you who your audience is. We're talking about business people, investors, entrepreneurs. How do I win? How do I get ahead? My message is to those people. God knows my mother was a school teacher for 32 years. She'll you know, say to me, hey, I got off work school at 3.30. We don't all have to be like that. Yes. Thank you, mom. I think the interesting part there too, is like, you know, for a lot of people who have those careers, there's a way that you can extend and, and reach a greater quality of life, reach a greater, uh, you know, you know, get out of a, the, that, that uh, wealth cycle that you're, that you're in through investment. And we get a lot of people who are in those qualified cat categories because they qualify for great mortgages. Banks love people with stable yeah, jobs, seriously, right? So a lot of them are some of our best investors. People who are trying to grow, grow portfolios. Well, and that's a whole nother podcast on, yeah. on, that topic and defining success. Uh, right. Some of us define success in financial terms, others in time with their families and all the rest of it. And you can't do everything. And at the end of the day on your deathbed, yes, I probably should have spent less time at the office, but that was a defining factor, at least at this point in my life. And you're either wired that way or you're not. So anyway, not to go down that path and hijack, but that's, we're talking to an entrepreneurial audience. So that's the message. Totally. And, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be worried about it. anyone who's listening to this is probably interested in, in that in that lifestyle. Um, so why don't we go back? I know there was something in particular that that we did want to talk about, and and this is probably a good segue into that. And that's the um, first time home buyers. Now, obviously, that, that's a hot topic across Canada. As both Dan and I try to place clients again on the mortgage side and on the real estate side, try to place clients on a daily basis or weekly basis into what would there be there be first time homes and. Uh, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone. It's harder than ever. So 
take that take it away Vince what what are your what, what's your take on on this and and the incentives being provided right now in, in the situation okay if 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 the entrepreneurial crowd listening takes away one thing from today I'm going to take this really 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 seriously okay if you're not taking advantage of the first time home buyers credit you're 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 making a tragic mistake and and I I don't say that in a mean way this is the I'm I'm 60 years old my kids are 30 years old so this is the advice I've been, I was given when I was 20, which seems like a million years ago. And this is the advice I give every young per person who asks me and listens. There's only one way to avoid taxes in the country of Canada. That's to buy a house. And when you sell it, it's tax-free. Before you're married and mortgaged, from the first day you scrape together the money for your first down payment from Aunt Brenda or your mom or your dad or extra jobs, buy something, live in it for a year and sell it buy another one, live it for a year and sell it. Sure, once your kids are in school and your wife says, we're not moving again or I'm leaving, that's coming for sure. Uh, you've, had, you've moved five times. In Canada, you can move every year. Now, of course, your girlfriend doesn't want to move in with you to some dump in, in a thing, but that's how you get ahead. You buy it for 500,000 and you sell it next year for 600,000 and you keep $100,000, 100 cents on the dollar, tax free people miss this opportunity they can never get ahead you got to move every single year you have to move into places that are less than optimum you have to do the work on evenings and weekends you have to paint you have to learn how to do concrete and even if you're an accountant you have to learn how to use a skill saw that's how you get ahead one chance for tax-free money in canada move five times and if you don't then it's on you yeah, it's actually funny you mentioned that because Nick and I always talk about like the sweat equity side of things and we're no stranger to doing to, uh, right. you know, like I, I have a couple of multifamilies now and I'm still, I, I, I excavated a basement this year. I mean, it was that when we were in the town and that was my exercise regimen, right? Couldn't go to the gym, couldn't do anything else. And I, I would go shovel a basement every single night for about an hour or two hours. And I was in the best shape of my entire living life. The, living the dream, right? And your friends are at the bar and they're going, yeah. well, what are you doing? And yeah. Saturday morning you get up, you're not feeling like shoveling a basement. But then in five years, you're living in a $2 million house and they're still renting. And again, that's not a hack on people. But if you want to get ahead, there's one absolute golden method. And I'm not going to beat this to death, but figure out how to get a down payment, buy your first home, fix it, sell it, fix it, sell it yeah. five times. Right. That's the key. Sweat equity. Sweat equity. And you got to do it. And that's how you get ahead. And everyone wants, how did my buddy get ahead? Well, he did just what I'm saying. And yeah. if you don't do that, you can't get ahead today unless yeah. you live in Moose Jaw. Yeah. And not many and people mean, live in Moose Jaw. Well, and even then, like, I mean, you're not, you might, you're not tapping into that, the annualized growth in a, in a place like Moose Jaw. Like, yeah, sure. I mean, maybe if you're lucky and you're really good at market timing in the past five, 10 years, you could yeah. do what you just described without having to do any of the sweat part. But you really got to know what you're doing. Like, you got to have the crystal ball to do that. Right. You do. You got to be in markets where there's growth and there's capital appreciation. I mean, you guys know all about cap rates and capital appreciation. That's for another day. But if you if you buy in something that's not going to go up in value, then that's stupid. Right. Uh, you know, you can sugarcoat it if you want, but don't do that. Don't buy in markets that aren't appreciating. You guys live in the GTA. You know where the markets are. We live in Vancouver. We know the markets are. Uh, you know, five years ago, I wouldn't have said you, you buy a home in Maple Ridge. Today, Maple Ridge is absolutely explosive. They went from zero condos to 10,000 condos. Well, if you bought a little house in Maple Ridge or Mission a few years ago, you've doubled your money. You bought it for 500 and sold it for a million. Move. Sure, you may not want to live there forever, but move and buy another one, another one. Got to go to Vancouver Island. You got to go somewhere. Um, seek out the markets where there's growth. Get in there. Put in the time. Put in the effort. Anyway, end of, end of rant, end of sermon. But that is the number one way to get wealthy in real estate period, especially for young people. Yeah, I, and I think it really, not only just that, but I think it also is probably the, the least of the barrier to entry, which is, right. which we see, you know, the hardest thing to do is get started. And if you can't get started, you're, you're just never going to get anywhere. So yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I'll, I'll never forget there was a contractor on my street growing up and he ended up living on three different houses on the same street. And every house that he left after a year was way nicer. And again, this is me as a little kid being like, what's going on here? Um, but it really changed my perspective. And again, there's, there's that there's also house hacking where you can go in and, and owner occupy a duplex and have someone beside you or above you or below you helping pay your rent. Um, 
which is another great first time home buyer strategy. Now, right. that's a perfect, again, segue into a bit of a multifamily discussion. So you're a multifamily builder, you've sold multifamily. Yep. Do you hold any multifamily yourself right now? What can I ask? What does your investment portfolio look like? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a complex question. The answer is yes and no. Uh, one of your questions that you gave me in the preview was what is the strategy, you know, for multifamily, especially pre-sale versus resale and what's coming? What are the new trends? So let me back this up a little bit. I don't believe in having an absolutely firm investing strategy. Others will tell you that you have to know what you're doing and follow. I, I Lack of focus uh, has made me a lot of money and lost me a lot of money, but I'll still go with that over being locked and loaded. So let me give you an example. With pre-sale in particular, there's one way in and three ways out. With resale, there's one way in and two ways out. I'm going to choose three whenever possible. Now that's going to change a little bit in the, in the coming weeks and months with interest rates. Maybe we have time for that today. Maybe we don't. So I'll, I'll be brief because I think your, your, your listeners know some of this, but when you buy a pre-sale, the biggest advantage you have is to be able to assign it in a rising market. Obviously that is not possible with a resale. You buy it on Thursday, you own it on Friday. It didn't go up very much in 24 hours. But if I buy a concrete tower and three years later I take delivery and I'm in the right market and I've done my homework and there's capital appreciation, I've got the ability to assign. I've got the ability to close and flip maybe a year later if conditions are whatever. And if I'm a long term investor, then I'm going to close, hold, rent it out and let somebody pay down my mortgage. So your question is, what does my portfolio look like? Well, it depends. Right now in hypersonic growth, I bought a whole bunch of pre-sale. Now, with the rapid appreciation, does it make any sense to close on this stuff if you're making ungodly amounts of money? Probably not. So I'm not going to get locked in and say, I'm a, I'm a buy and hold guy. No, I'm a make money guy. Now, if the market tends to cool just when completion time comes and my assignment opportunities are not there, I'm going to close and maybe keep it for a year or two. And if it goes crazy again, I'm in the making money business, right? And if it goes dead cold, like 1999 or some of these serious recessions that lasted for three or four years, guess what? I'm in the buy and hold business, right? Not because I want to be. So my portfolio varies with the temperature of the market, but you always have to have lots of pre-sale in your pocket because that gives you cards to play depending on the market. How, how do you feel about that when you think about the context of the greater Toronto area, especially where you know, I mean, 2017, we got burned really badly with this when they were pre-selling, you know, with valuations that were two years ahead of where they would have been. And, yeah. it, and, and that was on the, on the detached market. And, and the reason that it fell off was because of the tax. They, they put in a foreign ownership tax and non-resident speculation tax. Right now, condos are selling at like $1,400, $1,500 a square foot here. And the, the comparable resale across the street is, you know, a thousand bucks, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the, the, that spread might be extreme, but there are spreads that are, you know, in the 30 to 50% range. Is there still opportunity to, to do the assignment trade like you were talking about at the beginning there? It's becoming tougher as we get to the end of the market. So uh, an economist by the name of Michael Levy, Vancouver guy, you might remember there, uh, was he, he, him and I were talking one day and he said something to me, of course, it took me a while to get through my head. He said, the cure for high prices are high prices. And I kind of gave him a dumb look like, what, what does that mean? Well, I've been through five major recessions in my career and the cure for high prices are high prices. So what happens, whether it's a, a pair of socks or a house, somebody says, you know, socks can't cost $48. I'm, I'm not paying $48 for a pair of socks. And your buddy says, you know, you're right. I, I'm not paying 40. And then your girlfriend and then your mother and says, well, if you're not paying it and the market's over, it's over like that faster than anyone can react. The tap gets turned off. We are still, in my opinion, a little ways from that, but we're getting to the frothy tops. And what happens is there will come a day, GTA, Vancouver, doesn't matter, where the ability to uh, see any kind of significant capital appreciation comes to an end and people say, you know what, this just isn't worth it. And it stops. So Yes, there's still opportunities, but they're not necessarily in the downtown core. Now, I don't know the GTA well enough to say anything 
you know, knowledgeable about which, you know, do you go to Hamilton? Do you go, you know, where, where does it begin and end? So I don't, I don't want to play that game. But in Vancouver, you have to go out where the people are moving, where the, it's a terrible thing to say, where the financial refugees are moving. Because if you can't afford downtown Vancouver and your average household income is about 82,000, which it is across most cities in North America, you think of the guy that changes your tires or the person that's the assistant manager at Costco, maybe their spouse works three days a week as a child. Everybody makes 82 grand. Well, what does 82 grand buy you? Not very much, not very much. So you're not buying downtown at 14, 15, 1600 anyway. The foreign tax, don't even get me started. I, that was a red herring in my view. That didn't kill the market. High prices right. killed the market. Really? You know, like in West Vancouver, the properties are 34 million. Well, um, not many people are buying those. So let's not pretend that that was the reason. Right. Same say thing that, in Ontario. I'd agree yeah. And I say that respectfully. I, I think the whole thing's a sham, but that's another topic for another day. So high prices will end this market because people just simply run out of steam. Now, what happens then? On average, through five recessions that I've lived through, including 81, which was severe, that was a 22% interest rate that I was just coming out of high school, great time to get a job. Uh, so what happens is houses, condos tend to come off about 10 points. Land tends to come off about 30 points. Okay. Now, the, the trick is, does that mean the market's going to collapse and never come back? No, of course not. It just means that people are tired. And at a thousand bucks a foot, Next year, it's going to be 900 a foot. You still can't buy the damn thing at 900 a foot, but you're going to get a 10% thing. The problem is that people are going to wait. You hear this all the time. I'm going to wait for the bubble. No, you're not, because you're going to lose your job in the recession too, and then you got no money. So then you move back in the basement of your mom's place, right? Sorry, Nick. Uh, basement of your mom's place, because you got to save some money. So those people who sit on the sidelines thinking they're going to time this big crash, that's that's not going to happen. We have an immigration policy this year of 400,000 people, plus the 200,000 that didn't show up in the last two years because of COVID. There are not 600,000 housing units available. There are not. We can't build them fast enough. So even with interest rates, we have a supply issue, another podcast for why. That's another whole story. So this market, even when it takes a breath, is going to take a breath and it's going to go 10% higher than the highest peak we ever saw. So you, when you say we got hurt in 2017, the only time you get hurt really is because the appraisals don't match when you come to close. That's where you get killed. The appraisal market valuations, you guys are mortgage guys. Boy, some weird stuff goes on in, in that world because we need people to close, right? You bought it for a million. Now it's worth 900. You got 80% loan to value of 900. You got a hundred thousand dollar gap. Oops. Now what are we going to do in all my career? Thousands and tens of thousands of condos. This is how many haven't closed, right? Wow. You pe people tell you, Oh, they're never going to close. When the security guy at the site starts buying two, you know, the world's ending, but even <laughs> then, even then that guy finds a way because nobody wants to walk away from fixed 50, 80, hundred thousand in deposits. Right. You find a way. Ultra luxury condos were the NBA guys buying a condo in Hawaii and he paid five million. Now it's worth four. He walks from a half a million, whatever. But we're not talking about real people. You find a way to close. Appraisals are a thing. Again, that's a longer story. But we are approaching the end of the market to your, to your question. It's not here yet, but it's foolish not to think that trees are going to go all the way to the sky and this is never going to end. It will but it only ends for about 18 months and then it goes again, all right? So don't fear it. If the deal's right, buy it, don't sweat it, but understand one way in, three ways out, which way you have to be prepared to close. And if you can't close, if you're not financially capable, don't do it, especially now. Yeah, I think that plays interesting. It, um, it, it's an interesting note in the context of interest rate um, decision as well, right? Um, you know, it, it, we're, it's pretty obvious that the bank is going, the Bank of Canada is going to be raising interest rates throughout the year this year. Um, a, lot, yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of speculation that, you know, they're actually, I actually am surprised they didn't raise on the 26th. They're, they basically told us they're going to raise on the 3rd. They're, I think they're just waiting for the Fed at this point. Um, it seems like they're probably going to rush to do it to, to get as many increases in as they can over the next two years so that they can 
start decreasing rates again to stimulate our way out of the recession that'll likely be created by that. Um, so it's interesting that you, what you're saying about that cyclicality of, yeah, it could be bad, but it, you know, it could also be good in the fullness of time, right? Um, well, it will be good in the fullness of time. Right. Vancouver's not going anywhere, but Toronto's not going anywhere. These are world-class cities. I mean, we all know the obvious, uh, clean air, clean water, great schools, rule of law, stable government. People come from all over the world and, and come to here and say, you guys live in one of the greatest countries in the world, one of the two of the greatest cities in the world. You don't realize what you have. And the truth is, we don't. Uh, very, very quick story, I promise. I'm standing on the corner of Camby and, you know, somewhere, Camby and King Ed with a client who happened to be Chinese. And we're standing there and the, the, these little houses that were built in the 50s and 60s used to be worth 30 grand, 50 grand, 80 grand best, right? When you were back in Kitsilano, they were worth, you know, 500,000. Yeah. These lots are now teardowns at two and a half, three million bucks. Insane. I'm standing on the corner and this guy turns to me and he says, you guys always blame me, but you're the ones who are stupid. And I, I said, what? He said, I'm standing here five minutes from downtown, 15 minutes from a major airport, clean air, clean water, all the things, great schools, and you didn't buy your land. Now you're blaming us, the, you know, the foreigners, for buying your land. You stood here all these years in this beautiful city and didn't recognize what you had. And it's my fault? And of course, I'm standing there going, ah, yeah, I could have bought it when it was 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand, 200, five, and I didn't. Then the foreigners come in, scoop it all up at 2 million, and we say, well, they're ruining the city. Well, how come we didn't appreciate what we had? That's not going away. For me, the lens into Canada, in particular, the West Coast, is Shanghai. Whatever has happened in Shanghai is going to happen here. So Shanghai is now four to $5,000 a foot for anything downtown. Crazy. Well, Vancouver, right on Georgia Street, the most expensive stuff is going to be 3000 bucks a foot. It's going to be 5,000 a foot. Now we can pretend it's not going to be, but that's where our buyers are coming from. And 3,000 sounds a lot better than 5,000. So if you can come here and buy as much as you want of high-end product, doesn't affect the guy who works at Costco or anybody living in the suburbs. But if you can buy downtown real estate in a magical city for 3,000 a foot, you're just going to fly over and buy as much as you can, making it 4,000 a foot and then 5,000 a foot. So if you don't understand macroeconomics, if you don't understand the price of a condo in Paris, London, Shanghai, Tokyo, how can you understand the price of real estate in Hamilton, right? Or London or downtown Toronto. If you don't understand macroeconomics, then the pricing in these communities doesn't make any sense, but you gotta get on an airplane and go and see and say, okay, that's the buyer. That's where they're coming from. 400,000 people are coming with wallets stuffed with cash, buying our stuff at half price. Yeah. Right? Macroeconomics is the key to understanding microeconomics in real estate. I think global macro too. And like it, that lends itself well to the concept of density, right? People are like, why are these developers all building 3,300 square foot condos? It's like, who's yeah. going to buy that? And it's like, well, go, go to Shanghai and go look at the yeah. average square footage of a condo. It's a pretty simple yeah. question to answer when you have an economy that's driven by 400, 500,000 immigrants a year. Like, it that's makes exactly sense. Right. Yeah. And it, it is a trend towards housing. And, and it's a great question that you pose me. I have a, a note on there, you know, where, where is it going? And we can talk about that a little later, but where is the trend going and, and how and why and can homes get smaller and, what are people going to expect? And it's a it's a great question. So please let's come back to that if we have some time. For sure, for sure. And I just this this reminds me of other conversations we've been having where where we see real estate in Canada being forced to be more of a national uh, conversation, right? I mean, okay. I and Dan and I had this conversation. This came up in the last podcast. This same. It's a drive to the qualify market, right? So if you're yeah, if you can afford to live on Canby. Because I know those houses, um, and and fortunately, you know, ninety five percent of Canadians will won't be able to afford there. That's then right. you drive north, you drive east, you drive south, you drive west, and you find a market you can qualify and you live there. And then you know, just to throw in an old cliche, an old real estate cliche, it's not time, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market, right? You're not you're not going to be able to, as you just said, you've seen five cycles of of ups and downs, and and it always comes back, but it always goes down, just like the stock market and. You know, we're even seeing it with crypto now, which we don't have to get into because that's a whole nother story. But there's there's peaks and valleys. And, uh, you know, whether you buy at a peak or whether you buy at a valley, I think it always goes back to that that strategy, whatever your strategy is. If you're 
if you're a buy and hold guy, which which I am right now for for a larger part of my portfolio. However, um, you know, Dan and I just locked up a flip, which is a different. That's yeah. a totally different, um, you know, that's outside of my comfort zone. I haven't really done something like that before, but that's a different strategy because we're going to capitalize on the, the, you know, the burning hot market right now. We're able to get something and, and flip it. Why not? That's not something I would buy and hold. So I agree with everything you said. I think it just always goes back to that, what that strategy is. And then I think that strategy goes to what your why is, right? So like we spoke earlier, is it financial freedom? Is it freedom of time? But in my personal opinion, everything should be based off of finances because finances are the way to get your time back and the way to get, you know, provide for your family and provide for your charities and, and to really make an impact in the world. Only the rich can help the poor, even though it's not a popular saying, there it is. I want to go back on two points that you made, uh, sure. you know, to, to give you another old cliche, you don't wait to buy real estate, you buy real estate and wait. <laughs> Yeah. And that, that's been, you know, kicking around since the 70s. The other thing, though, I'm going to give you an asterisk because I love what you said, but I'm going to give you an old man, uh, you know, finger wag. <laughs> you drive till you can afford it, right? That sounds nice and, and we get it. Uh, you can't live downtown. You can't live in the West Side. You can't. However, however, here's the asterisk. The, we learned from Phoenix in 2008 and nine. We learned a valuable lesson. And it sounds cliche-ish, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. The pond, the big pond, dries from the outside in. And when you watch the movies from the Serengeti, it gets tougher and tougher and concentrated, and everybody has to go there. If you drive too far, you're dead. Okay? The pond dries from the outside in. If you bought at the corner of Scottsdale and Camelback, you survived the worst financial crisis in 100 years. If you bought in Surprise or some of these outlying communities, nature has taken them back. They drove too far. Okay? Yeah. There is a drive till you can afford it component, but you got to be smart about it. And again, I won't comment on where that is in the GTA, but for us, you know, if you, if you bought a house in Boston bar, because it was cheap and the, and the Boston bar closes because there's no work and the highway is shut, you're not going to do well. So be smart, drive till you can afford it, but also remember that the pond drives from the outside in. So the closer you can be to the middle of the pond, the better chance you have of surviving the dry season. Yeah, I've, I've never heard that before. And, and I, I love that. And it really does resonate. But that, that, that goes back to, you know, a deal's a deal. So no, not that. always though. That's just my old man voice. Not always. Just keep that in mind that if, if you're outside the pond in Africa during the dry season, you're dead. And that goes for real estate too. You're dead. So don't go too far. And that's I mean, like the diversification of exit strategies that you talk about. I mean, I love that as a primary principle in real estate, right? One way and three ways out. You can't say it better than that. Make sure you got your ass covered on the way out. And be flexible. Don't get yourself too locked in. You said, uh, Nick, you're not comfortable with flipping. No one went broke taking a profit, right. right? If somebody wants to give you money, take it. 20 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand. If you go to Costco with 10 grand, that's better than no grand. Right. And, and so you don't, you can always wish you could have made more, but this is supplemental income to help you get into other deals. So whatever, you're not a buy and hold guy. You're a, you're a real estate making money guy, whatever that means. Right. And you know me so well, there you go. <laughs> um, I just wanted to quickly touch on something you've mentioned. And I know one of them was just an example, but even Seattle, um, have you done much work in the States? Have you done much buying, selling, holding, um, building in the States? Because obviously a very connected markets. Um, I feel like we, you know, we kind of follow suit with a lot of the States, but from a real estate investing standpoint, there's such, I mean, they've got the 1031 exchange. They've got a lot of things that make real estate investing easier. And also in, in, you know, certain markets, you know, your, your entry into a place is $75,000, $80,000, $30,000. Now you got a $200,000 place that doesn't really exist in Canada anymore. So what do you, what's your take on the States? What's your experience down there and, and how connected and dependent is Canada on our big brother to the South? Boy, God, I wish we had hours to do this. The short <laughs> answer to questions, I've done lots of work in the States. I'm not going to claim to be an expert, but I've sold condos in Hawaii and Washington state and uh, California and everywhere. I, I've, I've done a lot of work in the States. One of the funnest things, even though it's politically incorrect today is I worked on the Trump tower project with a friend of mine who was, who was the sales agent. I just got looped in. Which city was that? In, uh, in Hawaii. 
Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Right. Right in Oahu. And uh, we did 700 million in sales in one day. Largest sale ever in the Western world. 700 my, million in one, in day. one day. And that was back a long time ago. So my buddy says, hey, you want to come over and work in Hawaii? I'm not paying you, but, you know, get over here. We're going to go have some fun. Okay, fine. So we get there and he says, I got a job. You're going to be in charge of customer dissatisfaction. I said, well, I, I don't want to be in charge of that. So what happened, of course, we booked two days of appointments. And these are big, heavy hitters, right? NBA guys, movie stars, everybody's flying in with their entourage. We were sold out by three o'clock on Saturday with a full day on Sunday of people showing up to eight o'clock in the morning. I'm here to buy my condo at the Trump Tower, Waikiki. Oh, well, good news. You made a great choice. Bad news. Go see Vince. What do you mean? Go see Vince. Vince had to explain that we were totally sold out because we couldn't have known. I mean, you always overbook a little, but we were overbooked by a whole day. It was it was so beautifully done and the timing was right. And uh, the guys who did it, not me, deserve all the credit. But what an experience to see that level of sales and and how pre-sales works and how you line people up and who gets to go first. And oh my God, that's another whole, I'd love to share that with you, but that's another whole podcast. So yes, here's the answer to your question. I wouldn't invest in the States right now unless you're very, very sophisticated. I would avoid it altogether for those who are listening. Not because there aren't opportunities, as you say. You know, you can go into Palm Springs, you can go into Phoenix, you can buy a little condo that you can use. But when you get really to understand the taxation rules and moving money across borders and how it actually works, for most people, it isn't worth it. If you can't leave your money down there, if you can't figure out how it done, the withholding taxes and all these things, the amount of, the amount of red tape for a Canadian to buy there, and I know people are going to say, well, you don't understand I, I do understand. So save the hate mail. Don't bother. Don't just don't bother. Go to Florida. Love it. I love the U.S. I, I, I would have a place in Palm Springs, this and that, but I would have it to own it, to use it, because the sophistication level of understanding the rules is not really plausible for the average investor. Did you say just, you have a place in Palm Springs? I, I was just down there. My, my wife is harassing me to death. As we speak, I was looking at places this morning and that's because we're old and we want to play tennis and that's what old that's, people do. I just went there. That's probably the most beautiful city I've ever been to in the U S I love the low rise. I love the mid-century modern. I love the location of it. Anyway, just, just interesting. Yeah, I, I, I love it too. I, I'm torn between Phoenix and Palm Springs because yeah. I, I'm a sports guy. So I want to go to spring training. I want to do all that stuff. And if you don't play golf and you live in Palm Springs, it's, it's tougher, but if you love right. tennis and country clubs and beautiful weather and, you know, getting happy hour. That's why all the old people are drunken in bed by eight o'clock. Seriously, the, <laughs> city's, the, the only thing open after 9 p.m. is the IHOP. Well, that's it, because they offer us food at half price at four o'clock. You drink till eight o'clock. You're in your mobile home drunk. And then they get up at six to play golf. Well, Seriously. Not, now I understand why, because everybody's in bed at nine o'clock. I guess the sun does set behind that mountain at like 3.30, right? But... Yeah. And then everybody goes back to their place. So anyway, that's a, a thing. But I, I would say as a concept, don't worry about the u.s markets unless you're really really a high roller or you're sophisticated or there's a really good reason there are opportunities within the areas that you live in i don't care if you live in saskatchewan or where you live there are opportunities if you look and there are small towns and there's gems to uncover without having the brain damage of trying to learn international laws yeah couldn't couldn't agree more and this is something that dan and i talk about together talk about with our investor communities and talk about to our clients is you know, deals are scarce these days, you know, the, you know, 10 years ago, you could go find a, an off market or an on market deal. And, and, you know, it was, it was, there was, there was gold everywhere that those days are done. Now it's about creating value. It's about finding what could be a good deal and turning it into a great deal. And how do you do that? You do that through knowledge, sweat equity, and, and, and having a good team, all, all things that you've mentioned. Work, save and invest. There's no shortcut. I, w I wish there was, but you got to work more than everybody else. You got to save more than everybody else and you have to invest better. And there's no shortcut, you know, not even NFTs. Well, friend, my son bought one yesterday and I'm still scratching my head. The greater pool theory. Yeah. I'm too old. Right? Yeah. 
<laughs> but, um, that's like a well, you could try and qualify that as an invest uh a strategy i suppose I, like i actually just got into the space as well but i i had somebody manage it and he was doing like it, it basically is a passive income play but yeah i agree with you there's no who knows everybody you know, what do i know I, my you know I, I'm, I'm too far past that i think i'll leave that for you guys well no i mean the podcast is called brick and mortar so uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly no, we're, we're right there with you no i'm i mean we're that uh, yeah that's um, a little out of my headspace as well for now but yeah, it's, it sounds like we could have uh, a number of these conversations in the future. So we'd love to have you back on as well. Um, you know, we want to be mindful of your time, obviously. Nick, is there any other I'm questions good. you wanted to ask before we wrap up? Or Vince, is there anything you wanted to add? Well, I think the uh, one of your questions that you posed to me is, uh, you know, what do we do in the rise face of rising interest rates? Yeah. And so let's do that if we have time. And let's talk about what is what does the future of multifamily look like? These are two passionate ideas for me. Can, yeah. can we do those two? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So interest rates have to go up. Let's go back to macroeconomics. You can't run a country without a nominal interest rate of about 5%. So basically this is BS that we're having now, even though we're taking advantage of it. Pension funds are collapsing worldwide. Europe is collapsing. Everybody's collapsing because you need 5% because of the rules of pension funds. They can only invest in blue chip things. Well, if your bond rates are, let's call them 1% or zero, how can the Tor Toronto on the Ontario Teachers Federation afford to cut checks for every retired teacher when they're investing their money at 1% with an inflation rate of four, right? That doesn't take a genius to say we're going backwards 3% and the teacher's not going to get their pension check at some point. If you don't have 5%, you can't run a country. That's why Europe is begging us not to raise interest rates because of a whole bunch of stuff going on over there. But if we don't raise interest rates, we kill our own country. If we do raise interest rates, people who own our, our paper are going to default. So the central bank is caught. They're caught in an impossible position right now. But to think that interest rates aren't going to get back to 5% is childish. They have to or our country implodes. People like me, old age pension, five years from now, I don't think there's going to be any with interest rates of 1% because we simply don't have any money. I'm not getting any. Okay, number one. So with interest rates going up, what happens? It, it becomes tougher and easier for investors what's going to happen now because it's harder to obviously finance because you guys are mortgage guys, but prices come off when interest rates go up. So now we have an offset, but more importantly, every quarter to half point in the increase takes 100,000 buyers out of the market. Now, we could argue it's 80 or 102, doesn't matter. Use 100,000 for today. People that you know that are barely qualifying as a mortgage guy no longer qualify once rates get to 4%. They are out. Well, what does that mean? That means tens of thousands of new people that have to rent. Well, guess what? You guys own all the properties. Yeah, yeah, you had to finance at a higher rate, but yeah, it was 20 grand cheaper because there weren't as many buyers. And so this is a balance. Investors win during this time. This is the time. Now, let's go back. One way in, three ways out. No, one way in, two ways out. Because you can't, there's no capital appreciation for the next few years. So if you understand the rules of the game and you know you're a temporary hold or a buy and hold, but your rents are going to skyrocket, you think they're high now, what happens when hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people can't afford to buy and still need a place to rent? the market's going to go completely insane. This is a golden opportunity. And that's why the rich get richer because guys sitting in cash right now who are starting to take their assets off the market like you guys are doing, flipping, put a little cash aside. So when you take advantage of that development community that can't sell their last five homes, you go in and make them an offer that he can't refuse. Your rents are going to go up. Sure, you paid 3% interest rate. Who gives a damn? It, it, it's a cup of coffee a month. Who cares? But people get so caught up. If I don't get one, eight, nine percent, I'm not a. I remember all of us were 10 percent interest. That's what interest rates. Forget the 22 percent. That was anomaly. If you could get money at 10 percent in most of my career, that was awesome. So three percent, four percent. I don't give a shit about that. Yeah. If the deal's right, buy it. Pass the cost on to your tenant because there are thousands and thousands of new tenants. Segway. What does multifamily look like in the future? 
And this is maybe our, our last thought that we have time for today. In Canada, according to me, we have put a lot of pressure on people from the, you know, the golden era of the 50s on that you buy a condo, you buy a townhouse, you buy a single family house, you raise your family, you go back to a condo or a townhouse, and then you die and they bury you out back. This is the cradle to grave scenario. And we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to say you're not successful if you'd never owned a house with a picket fence and you had two kids and a dog. That is not the macroeconomic view of housing anymore in the world. We have to quit saying to people that if you choose to live in a vertical community, I love that, I wish I said that, vertical community, <laughs> that you're a good person. You can live in a vertical community for your whole life. So what does that look like now? This is where the development world has to change and it's changing rapidly. Cradle to grave, you buy a studio, you get yourself a girlfriend, you buy one and a half, you buy a studio and den or a one bedroom and den. You have a couple of kids, you move up to the 18th floor. Your wife leaves you, you move back to the ninth floor. You end up, you die or she dies, you're back in the studio and they bury you out back. Okay, so what if I never left this building? What do I need to successfully live? I need privacy, I need recreation, and I need amenities. I need to be proud of where I live in this building for the rest of my life. What does that mean? That means I have to have wonderful amenities that we never used to provide. We used to provide a gym with three weights and someone stole it and the TV clicker never worked and they didn't have batteries and the whole thing was done, right? But now I need a place to have my online shopping delivered, my groceries delivered, a spectacular amenities room with the biggest TV that world has ever invented, free flowing food, Wolf and, and you know, Sub-Zero. Uh, I need privacy, but I also need places of community. I don't need swimming pools and hot tubs necessarily, they kill your strata budgets, but I need that big bocce court and the barbecues. I need a place to recreate because as you alluded to earlier, homes are getting smaller. That's a fact of life. So if a home is meant to sleep in, where do I live? Well, I live within my vertical community. So as developers, and I'll count myself as in, in a minor way, we have to rethink how we design buildings without blowing out the strata fees and provide amenities for life. If you grow up in Paris, you will never live in a single family home or even expect to, or Tokyo or Shanghai or London, never. And they're not miserable. They're not unhappy, but we can do better. Can imagine if the guy who lives in some crappy place in Paris and you've seen lots of them, they're old and they're dusty. And what if they got to live in a beautiful place, downtown Toronto with these amenities that were mind blowing and a 24 hour day concierge and all this stuff, you'd be proud to live here for the rest of your life. So stop thinking that not owning a single family house is a failure and start designing homes for people to live in from cradle to grave and we will have the greatest cities in the world. It's incumbent upon the developers to do that. And I include myself, it's incumbent upon me too. Yeah, wow, that was, uh, that's, that's, I like that. That's pretty profound to, uh, to think about it like that. Um, I do and again, think, it's, I think that's the next frontier for Canada though. And I, and I think it both well for the conversation you're having about, um, you know, the, the rents increasing. Like we haven't seen a reurbanization of demand yet from like a post COVID world in, in the GCA rents, rents are still down there. They were, they were at historic highs the month before COVID they hit all time highs. And, and now they're at, you know, they've come off by 20, 30%. That's because uh, really, people, people couldn't buy because pricing was also all time high. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, and you look at a, a country that's resource rich, you know, that, that has, you know, we've done well at agriculture. If anything, global warming is actually a good thing for us. You know, not that, not saying globally that it is, but you now know, wait till you're going to get hate mail now. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not disagreeing, yeah. but yeah, it's yeah, your no, for sure. But for Canada, I mean, the reality is it would be for for a growing season and for in climate migration, etc. Yeah. Um, but you know, if we're going to urbanize and and focus population, people live in the cities, and then out, the areas outside of the cities are for for making those cities work, growing food, you know, yeah. producing goods, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right, so. I'm interested to see, I completely agree with you, but it's, it's interesting to think about it, even in that, that macro context, that global ma macro context, where you see areas that are functioning exceptionally well globally, you know, China being a really good example, um, how that looks. Cause we're not, a lot of Canadian investors, micro thought investors aren't thinking about the, the things that you're talking about. Well, and you can't understand Hamilton if you don't understand Shanghai. 
Right. And, and that's the bottom line. And I mean, from where you guys are to pop over to Paris or to pop over to London is easy. Yeah. Go walk around, go, go see what a single family house costs there. And Hamilton looks like a bargain. Yeah. So all of a sudden people come back. I can't believe I could have bought this house. My grandfather, whatever, don't care. Yeah. Uh, the people who come to our country stuffed full of money are buying our stuff because we are not bold enough or sometimes smart enough. Like the guy chastised me. It's my own fault. I watched this growth and I didn't buy it. Why didn't I buy those places when they were hundred grand? If I was smart enough to know they were 2 million now, you know? Yeah. And a lot of, a lot yeah. of places globally do they, you know, places that are further along in their, their economic life cycle to yeah. us, they look at Canada and they're like, this is the new world. This is, this is the next frontier. This is a, an early, an early stage or early cycle real estate economy. Right. We look like settlers to them. Right. You know, yeah. a bunch of hillbillies that don't yeah. get it. Right. They come in, scoop up all our real estate, you know, hide the women, hide the silver and hide your real estate because the, the bad guys are coming. Well, why, why wouldn't they? Yeah. When it's such a fabulous place that we have created. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think that you just said my favorite line of the episode. If you don't, uh, you, you won't understand Hamilton. If you, if you don't understand Shanghai, that's, uh, that's, and yeah, yeah. I mean, that just, it's going to force people to think on a, on a bigger scale. Um, but unfortunately, Vince, I think we're going to, let's, I think we're going to have to try to wrap it up. We usually try to keep it to 40, 45 minutes kind of thing, but obviously we could probably talk the three of us probably chat for the next couple hours. We'll have to have you back on for a, for a round two to, you know, maybe later on in the year after we'll see what the next, uh, sure. two kind of two seasons hold for us and maybe have you back on later this year. Is there anything you want to finish off with? Um, we usually like to give, give everyone the opportunity to give, have a little bit of a plug. If there's anywhere people can reach you, um, please provide that information. Yeah, please. I, and I love it when people call me and I really do answer and I really will call you back. Uh, I am easy to reach at uh, pilot house real estate, uh, and just call me. Uh, my phone number is posted there. Everything's there. And look me up, send me an email. If you're thinking about investing, I love this stuff. So if you're looking at a property and say, oh, what should we do? And be prepared for a tongue lashing. If you're going to go because your girlfriend said we got to buy a shiny one. No, you buy a fixer upper. And she, if she really cares about you, she's going to move into this pile of shit with you. And that's oh, the way it goes. Work, save and invest. Don't cut that's corners. And that's relationship advice right there. Well, too. there it is. And if she loves you, she'll come with you. And if she doesn't, then goodbye. Because you got to, you know, you got to, I, I said this on a podcast a while ago, you're out there surfing in Hawaii and you see these people who don't catch waves. They sit there all day and they sit there all day and they say the surfing's crappy. And then there's always that guy that starts paddling and he's going to make something out of a wave and he's going to paddle. And the best kind of metaphor i can think is you got to paddle man you can't sit there and say oh pretty soon it's going to be better get into the market they say there's two times to plant a tree one was 10 years ago right and if you don't paddle you don't play and all those people who are going to sit and float around all day and say surfing sucks same as investing get paddling help yourself find a way get a buddy get a friend quit complaining Buy something together with somebody, get into the market. Cause if you don't, you're out. And people have been telling me that it's too late since 1976. Well, that's a while ago now. And in 19, 2096, they'll still say, ah, oh, it's too late. It's too hard. Paddle, paddle. It's a lifestyle. There you go. Old man advice. I love it. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. Keep paddling and moving to a shitty place with your girlfriend, everybody. There it is. That's relationship advice. Page 10 of my book. We'll talk about that next time. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Vince. It's been great. Yeah. Talk to you guys soon. Bye for now. Bye.